Hi, Miss Nikki here. Uh, welcome to Lymphatic System. So today we're going to talk about, um, specifically this is a lymph node. Most of us have heard of lymph nodes, so that's why I chose this slide for you. Uh, but lymphatic system is one of your organ systems, one of the 11 you should have learned in Anatomy 1, and it works in conjunction with immune cells to uh, target, fight off any pathogen um, that could be in your fluid. Um, and we'll talk specifically what fluid am I talking about in just a second. But here's the kind of the setup of a lymph node. It's going to have a cortex. And it's going to have a middle or medulla. And we're going to have, like I said, T cells. And we're going to have B cells. And we could also have macrophages. I'm going to abbreviate. And then you'll have some sort of capsule. So these are kind of bean-shaped um, scaffoldings, if you will. So it's a place for immune cells to kind of sit and wait or be transported through and kind of wait for them to come in contact with a pathogen that's in some of our interstitial fluid. So lymphatic system is basically returning any fluid that happens to be leaked by the blood vessel back to the blood. It's the fluid that didn't get taken up. So did not get taken up by the venule side of the capillary. So you remember we had our arterial and then we have our capillary bed and then we kind of merge to our venule side. So we know that nutrients um, like oxygen, glucose, right, are coming through the capillary bed here, but that the uptake is on the venule side. Well, not all of the waste and all of the CO2 gets picked up on the venule side. Some of it is out here in your interstitial fluid space. But it does have to be picked up and cleaned and then put back into your bloodstream. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. But three parts, lymphatic vessels, lymph, which is the fluid once it enters the vessel, we now call it lymph and then lymph nodes which are going to filter that lymph fluid and clean it before we dump it back into your heart. So lymphoid organs and tissues are going to provide a structure or a scaffolding for the immune cells to kind of sit and wait. Um, some of them are going to be moving in your lymphatic fluid but basically I think of it as immune surveillance, right? So lymphocytes, that's the T cells and the B cells and then uh, macrophages, right? So cells that can do phagocytosis. Um, so these structures include, so what are lymph organs and tissues? We have spleen, we have the thymus, we have tonsils, we have lymph nodes, and then some other lymphoid tissues like the appendix, uh, prior patches that we'll talk about. So the whole job of the lymphatic system is to return interstitial fluid and leaked plasma proteins back to the blood. So anything that doesn't get picked up on that venule side, it's hopefully going to get picked up behind the lymphatic system. Once that fluid enters the lymphatics, so any lymphatic capillary or vessel, it's now called lymph. And I think this is pretty interesting. This is kind of a lot of work, right? It circulates about three liters of interstitial fluid per day. So of course, this is not as fast as the heart. You know, the heart we talked about five liters uh, of, of blood per minute. Um, so this is kind of slowly making its way back to the heart, about three liters of fluid a day. So here comes the visual representation that I think helps a little bit. So first of all, here's your heart, right? And we have our arterial system and we're pushing blood out to the capillary. And then they're showing you the green lymphatic capillaries. And you can see how they're interwoven into the capillary bed. So remember what's behind. So this capillary bed is sitting on top. You have these lymphatic vessels intertwined. You're going to have tissues behind it. And then between the tissue and the capillary bed, you're going to have fluid. And that's that interstitial fluid we keep talking about, right? So heart, uh, heart pumps blood out and nutrients out. It goes to the capillary, right? We drop off our oxygen and nutrients. I'm going to abbreviate. And then on this side, we pick up our CO2 and our waste, and then we go back to the heart. So we've all got that part by, down by now. You can see that the lymphatic is picking up fluid 
and it's dropping it back into the heart and you're basically going to clean it before you dump it back into the heart. So it's kind of hard uh, to see here, but if we start it at the heart, let's say we drop off, all right, we pump out 100% of the blood. We don't really because we've talked about stroke volume, but you know what I mean. All right, so we have 100% of blood coming out and it's going to the capillary bed. Only about 85% gets picked up by the venous drainage. So where's that other 15%? That other 15% is your lymphatic system returning fluid to the heart after cleaning it. So it is important to, if your lymphatics are not working properly, this 15% doesn't make it back to the heart. If you drop off 100, pick up 85, drop off 100, pick up 85, what's going to happen eventually? You're going to have decreased blood volume, decreased blood flow, right? So this does affect blood pressure. Um, lymphatics have an important job, and this is why you'll also see them refer to uh, lymphatics and then cardiovascular. We'll often lump these two organ systems together and we'll say this is circulatory. Get it out. <laughs> All right, so hopefully that made sense. They also want you to realize that this is a one-way system. So in that image, we had our heart, we had our capillaries, and then the lymphatics was a one-way circulation, basically one way from the capillary beds to the heart. So it only flows towards the heart. Lymphatic vessels, we're going to have lymphatic capillaries, and then we're going to have larger collecting vessels and trunks and ducts. So this is kind of the same setup that we've seen before where you have, you know, a larger vessel, and then it kind of becomes a smaller vessel, and then it becomes this one single layer capillary bed, except for this is going in the opposite direction. So you're going to have a lymphatic capillary, and then that can merge to a collecting vessel and then that will merge into something really large like a lymphatic trunk trunk or duct. So lymphatic capillaries are blind ended vessels that weave between the tissue and the blood capillaries. So we saw this on the previous image. We saw the kind of the green uh, capillary lymphatic capillaries intertwining into the capillary bed. These are similar to blood capillaries but they're very permeable. So remember with the blood capillaries, we had uh, fenestrated and sinusoidal was the really large one. Um, these are very permeable. They can take up cell debris. And when I say they, I'm talking about lymphatic capillaries. They can take up cell debris, pathogens, cancer cells. So this is tumors. Right. They can take up larger molecules than the blood capillaries. So we do have a few places where these are absent, where you do not have lymphatic capillaries. And the, the brain is one of them, so brain, spinal cord, central nervous system. Remember, you have cerebral spinal fluid. So that's going to help drain waste away uh, in the brain and the spinal cord. In bones and bone marrow, you have really large capillaries here. And this is, if you remember, uh, bone marrow, this is where we have our hemocytoblasts, our stem cells. And those stem cells can enter um, into the bloodstream there because we have those really large, leaky uh, sinusoidal capillaries. So there's a couple places in the body where we don't really need these really large, very permeable lymphatic capillaries. So this increased permeability is due to two specialized structures. One is the endothelial cells will overlap, and I'll show you an image in just a second, and they form these mini valves. Something that we'll come back later and talk about in, I want to say it's 23, digestion. When we get to digestion, we'll come back and we'll talk about these lacteals. But these are just specialized lymph capillaries. They're present in the small intestines near the mucosa membrane, and they're going to help um, absorb fats. So basically, it's a specialized structure, very permeable, allows really large fat molecules um, to be brought in. So we'll talk more about these and how we process fat when we get to digestion. So let's look at the cells overlapping, the endothelial and the mini valves. Something to make note of, this is the same exact lining of blood vessels and the heart, right? So the heart chambers are completely 
heart chambers and the blood vessels are all lined with endothelial and remember endothelial was the same thing as simple squamous epithelium right one layer of cells that are great at diffusion so here's the figure from their textbook showing you these lymphatic capillaries that have these blind ended tubes so this is what they mean by blind ended right it's not they're not open on the end they're blind ended but they have these flaps and they just kind of overlap a little bit and so what's going to happen is fluid can rush in and once the pressure in here gets high enough so I'm going to say high pressure once the pressure from the fluid entering gets high enough it'll close these flaps So the lymphatic capillaries are going to drain into increasingly larger vessels. So a capillary would drain into a collecting vessel and then eventually we'll see trunks and ducts. Um, these collecting vessels are very similar to veins. They're just a little bit thinner. They have more valves, but they do have valves and there's a lot of branching going on. So they're very similar to vein structure. So that means they're also going to have uh, some muscle in them, right? We're going to see some smooth muscle. Um, we still have endothelial cells. Um, the collecting vessels in the skin are going to travel with the superficial veins, but we do have some deep vessels that are going to travel next to the arteries. And the arteries, when they're contracting, when you have a uh, pulsation of the arteries from blood moving, that's going to help propel some of the lymph that's in the collecting vessels so this the pulsating of the arteries helps move the fluid as well and then since we've got cells that are requiring nutrients right if you have a collecting vessel and it has smooth muscle well guess what it's got to have glucose and oxygen so you're going to see vasovasorum again and you should remember this from when we talked about uh, veins vasovasorum were the vessels within the vessels right that fed the cells and the tissue of the vessels. So we see the same thing in lymphatic vessels that we saw in veins. So you can see the pattern here, right? We're moving from collecting vessels to trunks and ducts. So trunks are formed from the union of large collecting vessels. They drain large areas of the body. Basically, we're going to empty our lymph fluid that's been traveling through all of these nodes and then we're going into uh, vessels, right? And then we're going into um, trunks and then eventually into lymphatic ducts. So the right lymphatic duct is going to drain the right upper arm and the right side of the head. The thoracic duct is going to drain the rest of the body, but they're all going to dump into the right or left subclavian vein. So this is probably what you need to stick with. Uh, I'd be happy if you know this. So this is a nice visual representation. You can see that we have a trunk coming in, another trunk over here, and it merges to form a duct. So this is one trunk and one trunk, and then eventually we merge into a duct. And then we said it enters into the subclavian vein. And then on this side, you can see the trunks and the thoracic duct entering into the left subclavian vein. So lymphatic fluid is dumped into your cardiovascular system at the subclavian veins. Here's the location of many of the lymph nodes. So they're showing you overall lymph transportation, but I want you to look at where we have the most nodes. So we have a lot of nodes here in the inguinal region. We have a lot of nodes in the axillary region, and then we have lots of nodes in the cervical region. So you can see your lymphatic straining arms and legs. It would make sense that both axillary, right? So draining from the arm, we've got to go through a whole bunch of nodes before we get back to the subclavian vein. We can see from the head and neck, right, lots of nodes that the fluid has to go through, and the nodes is where they're going to get cleaned, right, the fluid's going to get cleaned. And then the inguinal region would be the drainage from both legs. So we have this kind of increased concentration of nodes in specific areas where it's kind of the last chance before we dump back into um, 
the subclavian veins or the cardiovascular system. So some uh, clinical conditions, we can see some inflammation of the lymphatic vessels, and this can appear as painful red lines underneath the skin. We could have severe localized edema. Remember I said you're dropping off 100% and you're picking back up about 85%, and that 15% is traveling in the lymphatic. So if the lymphatic is damaged for some reason, I drop off 100, I pick up 85. What's going to happen here? That 15% is never making it back. It's staying in the lower limbs, and so that can cause um, edema or swelling. There's also some issues that can happen. So this is a parasite, and this parasite is transmitted by an infected a mosquito and they're basically thread like worms and they block the lymphatic drainage so they get picked up by the lymphatic capillary and then they block the flu flow of fluid back to the heart and you'll have this swelling so the lung system is a low pressure system very much like the venous how do we propel the fluid up against gravity into the subclavian veins? Well, there's going to be milking action by skeletal muscles. We saw this before with venous system, right? Pressure changes in the thorax during breathing. Again, we, we talked about respiratory pumps and skeletal muscle pumps in pulling the blood from the venous drainage back to the heart. It's the same thing with lymphatic. They're going to have valves, so the lymphatic system has valves that prevent backflow, just like the venous. Um, pulsation of nearby arteries helps push the flow up against gravity and then of course the little trap doors close the valves and then the fluid can't go back down and then there's also smooth muscle in the walls of lymphatics just like our veins have smooth muscle these uh, lymphatic vessels have some smooth muscle once they get larger so not the capillaries but the collecting vessels and the trunks and the ducts so very very similar to venous system so since we went out of order, right, the very first unit we did uh, endocrine and we did blood and then we talked about immune cells. So we've kind of gone into immune already. So this kind of just hits the highlights. It's kind of like, hey, do you remember? Because this is chapter 20, right? So uh, lymphocytes are the main warriors of the immune system. We have two different varieties of lymphocytes. So one type of lymphocyte is a T cell and the second type is a B cell, right? These T cells and B cells protect against foreign antigens. So foreign, right? Anything the body perceives as foreign. So a bacteria, a virus, um, a toxin produced by the bacteria. Also, if you have the wrong red blood cells, if you were given the wrong um, transfusion, and then also cancer cells or tumor cells. So these T cells and B cells are going to be found in lymphoid organs. So again, just a recap, do we know T cells eventually are going to make cytotoxic, right? We're going to see cytotoxic T cells, and then we also have our helper T cells. And then with our B cells, they're going to make a memory cell, and then you're also going to have your plasma cells, right? And those plasma cells are the ones that are secreting or churning out antibodies based on the antigen that the B cell saw, right? And then those antibodies can kind of act as tags and tag any foreign um, antigens that specifically bind to these antibodies and then target them for destruction, right? We do have other uh, lymphoid cells, so these would be cells that are associated with lymphoid organs. So not only T cells and B cells, but we're going to see macrophages. So they can do phagocytosis of any foreign substances. They can also help activate T cells. Then we have our dendritic cells. They capture antigens and deliver them to the lymph nodes. Um, I also talked about antigen, antigen presenting cells. You might see some of those too. And then we have reticular cells. So these reticular cells are interesting. They kind of uh, help produce the support system for these cells to kind of hang out. So they produce the stroma, the fibers that support other cells in the lymph organ. So some people like to think of it as kind of a mattress or a scaffolding where the immune cells can kind of sit and hang out. So this is a quick image kind of showing you the reticular cells that generate these reticular fibers.
and then you're going to see lymphocytes kind of hanging out and you'd see others like macrophages here. So it's kind of the framework for the lymphoid organs. So this is just a gentle reminder. Do we know where all this comes from, right? So lymphocytes, that's T cells and B cells. Monocytes, that's going to be macrophages. And can you think to back to where all of these came from? So remember your hemocytoblast that makes all of the formed elements in your blood. So of course we have to have subcategories. So we're talking about lymphoid organs. And there's two functional categories. One is called primary lymphoid organs. This is where we have T cells and B cells maturing. Right, so T cells are going to mature in the thymus, B cells in the bone marrow. Well, specifically bone marrow could be either because this comes, that's where we got that hemocytoblast, right? But we're going to see that T cells get educated in the thymus. We also have secondary lymphoid organs. This is where we have mature lymphocytes, and basically it's the ideal site for surveillance. So the lymphocytes and the macrophages are just kind of waiting. So if you think of like a lymph node, you might have a T cell and a B cell hanging out and waiting for that fluid to go through the lymph node. And then the B cells and the T cells can spot the antigen, tag it, uh, attack it, you know, kill it, whatever they need to do, along with macrophages, which um, can engulf and digest and spit out the pieces, right? So the second or secondary lymphoid organs is going to be lymph nodes, spleen, and something called MALT. It's mucus-associated lymphoid tissue. And don't let that scare you because you already know two of these. Your appendix is a MALT lymphoid tissue, and then so is tonsils. So we'll talk about those coming up. So here's a nice image to show you the difference. Where do we have these primary lymphoid organs? It's your thymus and it's the red bone marrow. This is kind of where we create the T cells and the B cells from our uh, lymphocytes. And then we have tonsils, lymph nodes, spleen, Pryor's patch, and appendix. This is all that secondary lymphoid tissue. So lymph nodes are one of the principal lymphoid organs. So hundreds of them scattered throughout the body. They're going to filter that lymph fluid, right? They're going to filter it. They're going to destroy any microorganisms before they return it to the bloodstream in the subclavian veins, right? We do not want this contaminated blood to make it to our heart. So we got to clean it first before we dump it back into the subclavian vein. Nearly all of the body surface um, in high concentration in these areas. We kind of talked about this, inguinal, axillary, and cervical. Another thing that I think is interesting about the location is look at the cervical, right? We're constantly putting food in our mouth and it has bacteria and fungus and all kinds of fun things, right? If you're a kid, you're putting your fingers in your mouth, you're wiping your nose, all that good stuff. So there's a big concentration here before we dump into the subclavian. And then I said with the axillary, here underneath the armpits, it's draining the arm. And then here in the inguinal region, this is also another region that's exposed to the external environment, right? So through the urethra or through the vagina if you're female or through the anal canal, you're exposed to the external environment just like when you put food in your mouth or you breathe in, you're exposed to the internal environment. So I, it's kind of dual purpose here. It's draining both the arms and both the legs. And we kind of have this box that we're trying to make sure that this fluid is completely cleaned before we dump it back into the really important area of our body, which is our thoracic cavity, right? So basic functions of the lymph nodes, they're going to clean and filter that fluid, the lymph. Uh, macrophages can destroy uh, microorganisms or pathogens, and then we're going to have our lymphocytes, our B cells and T cells that can be activated and mount an attack against the antigens. So here we have the structure of the lymph node, and the reason I want to show you this is I want you to see how many afferent lymphatic vessels there are versus efferent. So remember efferent, kind of exiting, afferent, we used to say ascending, but if you, in this case, if you want to think of entering. Um, so this is the lymph fluid flowing in. It has five ways to get in, 
but it only has two ways to exit. And what this does is this slows the lymph down. And we're going to see this come up again in the kidneys, which is why I'm pointing it out to you. So these are tiny little bean shaped, about an inch. They're going to have a fibrous capsule. Again, they're going to have a cortex. I showed you the image in the beginning. They have a cortex and they're going to have a medulla. And that we're going to see certain cells more prominent in either the cortex or the medulla. So in the cortex, we're going to have dividing B cells. So that's where we have the memory cell, right? And then we have the plasma cells. We're, we're creating these, right? We've The dividing B cell has recognized an antigen, and then that particular B cell starts growing up. And then we differentiate into the memory and the plasma cells. You're also going to see dendritic cells in the cortex. You're also going to see T cells. So T cells are continuously circulating, but you're going to see them in the cortex. You can see them in the medulla as well, but they want you to kind of make the distinction that in the medulla is where we're actually going to see the plasma cells churning out antibodies. So again, here's the cortex. In the cortex, you could see T cells. You could see B cells you could see uh, macrophages, right? Oops, there we go. And then this medulla part, this is where we're actually going to see plasma cells that are churning out antibodies. That's kind of the distinction they want to make. Also, this is where the fluid comes in, and this is where the fluid goes out, right? So this is where you'd find the cells that are first going to see the antigens, and then as they're traveling, they're going to copy themselves. And then finally we get here and we've got a whole bunch of plasma cells churning out tons of antibodies. And then those antibodies are going to be in the lymphatic fluid, right? So lymph is going to enter the afferent lymphatic vessels. It's going to travel through, they call it the sub -cap capsulary sinus and then some of the smaller sinuses. I'm not so worried about you knowing where the sinuses are. They enter the afferent, they travel through the node, and they exit at the efferent vessel. I would make sure that I know afferent and efferent. We're going to have to know it again later when we do kidneys, so you might as well know it now. Having fewer exiting or efferent vessels causes the flow of lymph to stagnate and allows the lymphocytes and the macrophages time to carry out their functions. So we usually think of stagnate as bad, but in areas where you're trying to identify a pathogen or you're trying to tag something for removal or if you're trying to reabsorb something, you want slow and steady. Right? So slow and steady is good when we're talking about any kind of filtering. We're going to see this slow and steady in the kidneys again. So the fluid, the lymph, needs to go through the lymph node slow enough for the immune cells to recognize and do their job and become you know, activated and, and see those antigens and start making antibodies. So you, slow, steady. Um, another clinical kind of feature, I'm sure we've all heard somebody say they had swollen lymph nodes, right? So swollen, tender lymph nodes that result when the nodes are overwhelmed by what they're trying to destroy. So there's tons of bacteria in the lymph node. You also have dividing T cells and B cells. And so the lymph nodes are not able to work fast enough to clear this bacterial infection. Um, so buboes, those are inflamed, swollen, tender lymph nodes. Um, bubonic plague was named after this feature. So this was an infection and it caused the buboes or the inflamed uh, lymph nodes. And then there was also uh, tissue death. So skin and tissue death and the skin would start turning black um, because the tissue was dying. So it's kind of like gangrene, right? But it had kind of this black appearance. And so this is also how they came up with the black death, right? So the bubonic plague was also known as black death. Um, also, just something to note that the lymph nodes can become secondary cancer sites. So if you had a cancerous tumor and it made it into your lymphatic system, well now the cancer cells can become trapped in the lymph node and they can start multiplying. So sometimes if you heard of somebody that went in 
had cancer and they did a mastectomy, you know, removing the breast tissue, they might have also had to pull lymph nodes out as well because if any of the cancer cells had made it to the lymph nodes, if they were setting up shop there, that was going to cause problems, right? So the spleen is the largest lymph organ. Basically, the spleen has, you know, several functions, right? So it it cleans the blood of aged cells and platelets. So we talked about this briefly when we talked about um, cardiovascular, um, it, specifically blood, and we talked about the breakdown of products of the red blood cells. We also know that the spleen stores blood platelets. It also can store um, monocytes, which will help make um, macrophages. And it will also store old red blood cells, right? So the spleen has a you know, a number of functions here that are kind of like emergency functions, right? Oh, if I had, you know, um, a hemorrhage, I might want to have extra platelets or extra red blood cells. And if I have some giant gash in my leg and I'm bleeding out, I might also want to release some extra monocytes so that macrophages can form and, and, and clear up the, the debris because now I'm exposed to the external environment, right? So the spleen also is a site of a lymphocyte proliferation. So again, blood has to go into your spleen in order to break down the products and save some platelets and at the same time you have lots of immune cells in there that are kind of like oh this is the blood that that just came from the body let me go through it real quick and see if there's anything in here that i need to worry about so the structure of the spleen has two distinct areas one's the white pulp and one's the red pulp you can see here this is white pulp White pulp is going to have lymphocytes sitting on reticular fibers involved in immune function. And look at the location, right? This is the blood that's flowing in. So this is could be possible dirty, contaminated blood, and it's going through the white pulp section first. And that's where these lymphocytes can go, ha-ha, you're not supposed to be here, right? You're a pathogen, I must kill you, right? So then we have the red pulp area, and the red pulp area is going to be all of this other kind of the spongy pink looking stuff, right? This has tons of macrophages. This is where we're going to get rid of worn out red blood cells. Um, we can also, uh, the macrophages can also target pathogens if they made it past the white blood cell or the white pulp area. The spleen has a really thin fibrous capsule. So any sort of direct blow or trauma, like a car accident, um, seat belt, right, um, can cause um, the spleen to rupture and it can spill blood into the peritoneal cavity. So remember your visceral and parietal peritoneum, this is what we're talking about. So the cavity where that houses your digestive organs, right? Your kidneys are behind that peritoneal cavity. So sometimes they have to go in and do a splenectomy. So we have to remove the ruptured spleen. Um, so they have discovered that you can remove part of the spleen and that it can often repair itself right? Um, if you have to remove the spleen, usually the liver and the bone marrow can take over most of the functions. So it, it's not terrible, um, but it's, it's, it's probably not great. It's there for a reason. I know sometimes people think, oh, the spleen doesn't really have a purpose because you can live without it. Well, we can also live without our large intestine, but our large intestine still has a purpose, right? So um, you can survive. It's not the end of the world. We have other um, areas that can take over the fun some of the functions of the spleen. So this malt area is really interesting. So this mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. So it's lymphoid cells, right? And they're in areas where we have a mucosal lining. So lymphoid tissues in mucosal membranes throughout the body. And we're going to look at tonsils, priors, patches, and appendix. So basically, they're trying to protect pathogens from entering the body, and we're going to find them in those mucosal areas. So a tonsil is probably the simplest lymphoid organ. It's basically just a ring of lymphatic tissue. Um, you find it, you find all of them near the pharynx. And the tonsils are going to function to gather and remove any pathogens in food or air. We will learn these locations when we do respiratory, which I think is chapter 22. But let me show you an image. So here's a nice image. You can see your pharyngeal, your palatine, your lingual. They also talk about tubule, tubule tonsils down here. Um, so 
you can see this is any air that you breathe or food that you eat. These tonsils are there to capture any pathogens that happen to be in your air or your food pathway. So they kind of like form rings around your, your pharynx. We have above, we have below, we have to the side, right? And they form these crypts. So basically if I'm a pathogen and that pathogen gets into this crypt area and then this crypt area can seal and we've got B cells and T cells and macrophages that can try to kill the, whatever pathogen is trapped in this tonsillar crypt. The bad thing is, again, if you have a bacteria that's growing out of control. So you have increased growth in the bacteria, it gets trapped, all of this tissue starts swelling. And so that's why people sometimes have problems with their tonsils. They're like, oh, I can't breathe, right? It's all having to do with some sort of bacterial infection that your body's not able to control. So here we have the term Pryor's patches. You may not have heard of these, but these are in the small intestinal wall. So these are similar in structure to tonsils, and they're going to help destroy bacteria and prevent them from breaching the intestinal wall. They also have some memory lymphocytes, right? So we talked about T cell and B cells, both creating memory cells. So the next time you get infected, your um, downtime is, is much shorter, right? So you can actively start making cytotoxic helper and antibodies in a shorter period of time. So these prior patches, um, I'll show you an image on the next slide. So you can see here, these prior patches are scattered throughout the small intestines. And again, these still, this one is considered malt. This one's considered malt mucus associated, right? And so is the appendix. So the appendix is an offshoot of the first part of the large intestine that's called the cecum. So the cecum pouch, when the small intestine dumps into the large intestine, that pouch is called the cecum. And off of the cecum is the appendix. There are tons of lymphoid follicles. They're very similar to Pryor's patches and what they do. So what's the appendix supposed to do? It's supposed to destroy bacteria, prevent them from breaching the intestinal wall of the large intestine, right? So we're talking about large intestine now. And it also can generate memory lymphocytes, memory T cells and B cells to fight infection. There's also been some interesting claims about the appendix also storing good bacteria. So in case your small intestines, if all the good bacteria in your intestines was flushed out, your appendix could repopulate your good bacteria that we need to help us break down food and, and help supply us with some of our vitamins. So now we'll talk about the thymus. Remember this is a primary lymphoid organ along with uh, red bone marrow. So this is a lymphoid organ where T cells mature. We talked a little bit about this in chapter 21. Most active, largest in size during childhood, eventually it stops growing and in adulthood it atrophies. So they'll often talk about education of T cells. So the thymus educates T cells. So it does not directly fight antigens. It strictly matures T lymphocytes. Remember we talked about antigen presenting cells and you kind of make a catalog, right? So you're like, this is, you know, a Miss Nikki liver cell. And your T cells say, okay, check. And then we'd look at a Miss Nikki blood cell and the T cells. Okay, okay, check. I got that. And then what happens if a bacteria comes in and there's a bacterial cell? The T cell sees this and goes, uh, nope, right? You got to go die, right? And you mount an immune response. So the thymus is basically really active when you're a child. Um, and then once you've seen, once your immune system has seen every type of cell that you have and, and kind of categorized, yes, 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 we got it. This, these are all supposed to be here. Then there's no reason to have the thymus and it starts to atrophy. Um, this might be why we have autoimmune issues as we get older. What happens if your T lymphocytes forget 
oh, this is a Miss Nikki liver cell. And all of a sudden now your immune system is attacking your liver cells, right? So there, there's something to this, and, and you can do more research if you'd like to. But what I want you to know is the thymus has no B cell production, has nothing to do with B cells. The sole goal of the thymus is to educate T cells um, as to foreign versus self. And the thymus is most active when you're a child and starts to atrophy as you get older. So the beginnings of the lymphatic system um, and the lymph nodes are seen by week five. This runs right behind week four, which is heart development. So we can see the heart by week four. Uh, lymphatic organs arise from mesoderm. This is kind of the same. This is the middle. And we'll talk about this in development. It's not as important right now. Um, the spleen and the tonsils work really good um, when you're first born, but everything else is poorly developed. So we got to clean our blood and we stick our hands in our mouth all the time. So those two things are good to go. Everything else it needs more time, right, to develop. So high numbers of lymphocytes appear right after birth and their development parallels that of the immune system. So basically more lymphocytes, more exposure to foreign versus self, and this helps create a healthy immune system.